This is a lecture about offer and acceptance, which is obviously a part of the law of formation of contracts. The, to understand uh, this area, it is good to begin with understanding what a contract is. What are the components that make up a contract between two people? Then we can more easily talk about how to form a relationship where you have those components. There are two parties who have an interest in a contractual relationship. First, the two people who are making the contract, those pair, they have an interest because if I make shoes and you make grow corn and I want to exchange some boots for the corn, then we both have an interest in making that transaction go smoothly. Secondly, the public itself has a stake in that. The reason is because we need trade and the way our society works because no one makes everything that they need and since most people are specialized in what they do, you need to be able to buy other things uh, from other people that's a part of their specialty. And so society wants these bargains to go along smoothly. So society wants them to go smoothly, the two people who are striking the bargain want it to go smoothly. Uh, the, uh, uh, the way the bargains uh, operate then, with that in mind, are as follows. If you and I uh, strike a bargain about something, and we in that bargain can agree that we intend for the community, the public, to come and enforce our bargain if one of us doesn't go through with it. In other words, we can make that kind of bargain. I will sell you, I'll trade you the shoes and you'll give me some corn, but we both agree with each other that if one of us doesn't do what he or she was supposed to do, that the, we want the public to come in and make them do it. Okay? That's what we intend. So in order to have this bargain then, we need to agree on what the bargain is because if the public has to come in to enforce it, they need to know what the terms are so they can enforce. So we need to know what the, the terms of the bargain are, and we need to agree that if either of us doesn't do what he or she's supposed to do, we want the public to come in and make them do it. Now, one last point here is that even if we want the public to come in and enforce our agreement, the public might not do it if the agreement is about something that has nothing to do with commerce. Because the public is interested in making sure that these transactions in commerce go smoothly, but they don't really have a stake in whether or not me, the, an agreement between me and my girlfriend goes along smoothly. And so if I agree to, uh, to I'll pay the, the, the movie if you'll pay for dinner, then uh, society really isn't going to enforce that. It's not, it has nothing to do with commerce, and. It's not intended that the public would come and enforce, but even if we intended for the public to come and enforce that, they wouldn't do it. Now, and so to have an agreement that is enforceable legally, what we need then is, first we need to agree that we want the public to come and enforce it. Secondly, the terms need to be clear enough so the public can do that. And finally, it needs to be about a subject that the public is willing to spend their energy to enforce because certain subjects are just purely social, they're not commerce. Now, so with that in mind as to what we have when we have a contract, we have this enforceable agreement, an enforceable bargain, uh, that's what we have. And the question then becomes, how do we get there? And the answer is typically the way we get there is I make a proposal to you for a bargain. I say, let's do so and so and uh, I describe the bargain, and then I say to you, not only am I proposing this bargain, but I am proposing that we strike this bargain and we agree that if either of us doesn't do what they're supposed to do, we want the public to come in and enforce it. So if we agree, if I make you a bargain and says, here's the bargain I propose, and I also intend for this to be enforceable by the public, and do you agree? Do you want to agree to this bargain and agree that the public will come and enforce it if we don't do it ourselves? 
And it's, so when I make my offer to you, my offer really is describing the bargain and proposing that we uh, uh, have this intent of public enforcement. If you say yes, that you agree to all of that, then we've got a contract. Now, the, uh, uh, when I uh, try to form the bargain with you, where I'm going to make the proposal, the question then becomes, how do you decide whether or not I intended for the public to come in and enforce this bargain if, I don't, if you or I don't do our part? How do you decide that was my intent? Okay, and that's a big deal. What we do is the following. First, we replace the people with reasonable people. This is a reasonable person. And let's say this is the buyer, and over here is the seller. We also replace the seller. This is a reasonable person buyer. And we replace the seller with a reasonable person a reasonable seller. And so now, if this is the person who is making the proposal, the person says, uh, here's my bargain, so you've got to con convey the bargain to this person. So I must convey the bargain, also the intent. Now, uh, the way that you convey this now becomes very important. Uh, if uh, uh, you've got to let the two people, these two people, talk about the bargain that they plan to get into. You got to let them say, well, how much will it cost? And try to, you know, are you interested in buying it? And how wonderful device it is? And all kinds of conversation that people will have about the object that's going to be traded. And just because they're talking about it, you can't use that as the intent to be bound, to, be, to form a contract. You got to go, you got to let people talk freely. So how, what is the point where their talking is not just talking anymore, it is uh, showing intent, it's mounts to an offer, intent to contract. And the answer is that you need a promise. When uh, this person makes a promise to this person, uh, that's what you're looking for. So that, for example, in an advertisement where I'm advertising because I've got stuff for sale at my store, there's, there's no promise in the advertising, I will sell this to you if you pay me a certain amount of money. I'm just asking you to come in and, and look at my stuff and make me an offer. Uh, and so it's when, uh, if, if I say, uh, 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 you say, Emerson, do you want to sell Blackacre? And I say, and, uh, what would you ask for? And I say, well, uh, you know, $50,000. Well, that is not saying I will sell it to you for $50,000. You've got to find a promise. And just merely quoting a price or giving, in other words, here when you, when you, when you, give a, when you quote a price, that's not a promise. When you give an opinion, that's not a promise. When you place an ad, that's not a promise. And so you've got to find language where the person is promising, I'll do this for you if you'll do that for me. Okay? And these things don't constitute that. A quote doesn't do that, for example. Uh, now, this promise isn't always just words. In fact, most of the time, it will be a combination of what the person said, the environment in which they were in, maybe even the way they said it. All those things will contribute to whether or not a reasonable person in this position would believe that this person is making a promise. For example, if we're in a situation where uh, people are, 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 are trading with each other, all, all over, each, each person 
making trades with other people, and now I try to make a trade with you, well, it's all these promises going on, so naturally you're going to expect that this is a, a commitment to, to trade. If, uh, if, the, if I come to your hotel and I stand there and I hand you a, a credit card, even without saying anything, you would think I want to rent a room. So the point is that to find this promise, you look at what words did I use. If I use the word offer, that's going to sound more like I am making a promise to do it. If I use the word promise, that will help do it. If I use the word quoting, that is less likely. So you use, use the words that I use and the circumstances or the environment in which those words were used. Uh, is it a commercial environment, a social environment? Is it a party? What's going on? And so the, you use everything you can to try to figure out if a reasonable person, objective standards, a reasonable person in this position would believe that this person is promising to do something if I'll do something back for them. And that's how you deal with these ads, opinions, and quotes, and so forth. There was a question on the bar exam where a, uh, a, a company that did house cleaning went from door to door, and on each door they hung this little door hanger that says, we will clean your two-bedroom house for so much money, and gave some details of the cleaning. And now, so usually ads are not uh, offers because they don't contain the quantity, and most of all, they don't show a promise to do something, a commitment to do it, on a condition that you do something back for me. Well, but when you go from door to door, and you hang on every door, we'll clean your two-bedroom house for so much money, uh, that sounds enough like a promise. I will do this if you'll pay me. And it's specific enough because it's a two-bedroom house. Anybody that's got a two-bedroom house. And so that had to be treated as though, well, maybe that is an offer. And if the person shows up the office and says, I accept, maybe they have a contract. If that's not an offer, then you have to look when the customer shows up at the office at the words and circumstances there to decide if they formed an offer, an offer at that time, they formed a contract at that time. So that was a case where hanging these things on the door uh, might have been an offer, because there may, you could read that as a promise. There was another case on the bar exam where this 15-year-old uh, woman, girl named Ellen, read uh, an ad in the paper that says, if you come to this disco, discotheque, uh, uh, and uh, you can participate in a door prize, uh, a chance to win a trip to Europe for two, if your name is picked you know, out, out of the door prize thing. And so this 15-year-old uh, girl goes there in response to seeing the ad, gets a number at the door, and indeed her number was picked to win the door prize. Now, when was that contract formed? Well, if you look at the ad, it says, come here, and if you, so if you come here, you can participate and the door prize drawing. Well, is there a promise there? I think so. I think we normally ads don't constitute promises, but if I say, uh, I have one fur coat for sale, I'll sell it to the first person who show, first come, first serve, that's a promise, and that's probably an offer, even though it may be in a newspaper ad. And here, what Ellen was told, if you show up here, we will give you a chance to participate in the door prize drawing. And, I, and she showed up and did that, I think that was an offer. And when she showed up and got a number at the door and so forth, she's uh, accepting the offer. And when they drew her name, uh, they're going to have to pay her. So uh, that's how you decide whether or not an offer has been made. Uh, the, uh, uh, the bargain itself, of course, you have to identify the terms of the bargain because if the public is going to come in to help, they got to know what the terms are. And so the bargain itself, the terms that you need here are the, the parties, which is who the parties are is seldom a problem, the price, the subject matter, and the time for performance. Subject matter includes quantity, includes you know, what is the item and what is the quantity. If it's UCC, if it's, if it's services, quantity doesn't mean anything. So you have to describe the bargain, show the promise, and now you've got an offer. 
So now that you have an offer, how about the person who is going to accept? What does it take to accept? And the answer is that the person uh, will to accept, the, uh, they, they can do it several ways. One is, well, first of all, since the person is making the offer, when you make the offer, you are creating the power of acceptance in the other person. They have the power to form a contract by accepting and they can accept the proposed bargain uh, by if uh, in whatever way that I say they can accept it. Since I created the power of acceptance in this offeree, I created the power of acceptance and I can tell them what you got to do to accept. And so I get to describe what constitutes acceptance. And they either do it my way or there may not be an acceptance at all. If I want it done in a particular way, that has a certain speed of getting the message back to me, and you use some less efficient way, then the contract, your acceptance will be effective upon arrival, if it arrives you know, within a reasonable time, be effective upon arrival instead of being effective upon dispatch. So the person can accept by doing what the offer says to accept, uh, or the person can also accept impliedly rather than doing it that way, for example, if you send me some goods as an account, I want to buy some shirts from you. You don't have quite the shirts that I want, but you send me some other shirts, and you tell me this is an accommodation because you don't have the ones I want. Well, if I keep the shirts, okay, that's going to be accepting that, that offer for the other shirts. So I can accept by keeping the goods. I can also accept by doing the act. Whatever, instead of promising to do the act, I can actually do the act so long as the act is completed by the time the promise was due back to you. Uh, so I can accept, impliedly accept by doing the act, by keeping the, the property, uh, or by doing what you told me to do in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the offer. Now, the, uh, so that's how we make an offer, that's how we accept. The, there are a couple of issues that remain here. One of them is how do you terminate offers? And there's really nothing very surprising here about how to terminate offers. You can terminate by rejection or counteroffer. We all know that. You can terminate by lapse of time, either reasonable time or the time stated. You can terminate by the offerer dying or becoming incompetent, such as insane. Uh, the offer, will, the power to, will be, to accept will be terminated by the offeror revoking it by destruction of the subject matter, by non-occurrence of some condition proceeding to acceptance. In other words, it says I can accept only if certain conditions occur. If those conditions did not occur, then I have no power of acceptance. The uh, surviving illegality at the time that we made the contract, heroin was legal, but by the time we're ready to perform the contract, heroin is illegal. So supervening illegality will terminate the offer. Now, if there is an option contract to terminate that kind of an offer, this is an offer that someone is paid to keep open. And if you've paid someone to keep the offer open, uh, it will terminate when the, when the option expires. It will terminate by destruction of the subject matter. The non-occurrence of a condition may cause it to expire. And if that condition can't happen anymore, and supervening illegality. What's to be noticed here about terminating options is that uh, if you make me an offer and I pay you to keep this offer open for 30 days and you're selling me your car for $1,000 and I paid you a dollar to keep it open for 30 days, several things to keep in mind. Number one, that if our uh, option contract is in writing and it recites that you have received the $1 from me, it doesn't matter that you never really got the dollar for these option contracts. Just reciting the fact that for one dollar received, you promised to keep the offer open for me to buy your car for $1,000 for the next 30 days. Secondly, during that next 30 days while I've got this op option, suppose I make you a counter offer and I say, uh, uh, will you sell me the car for $900? Okay, well, uh, the, that counter offer doesn't terminate the, uh, the option. I have a right to buy your car for the next 30 days. And making counter offers during that time does not terminate the offer. I can make counter offers and it's still a good, the option is still good. 
Uh, also, you cannot revoke. Now, if someone dies, that terminates. Well, pardon me, even death does not terminate the option. If the person has an option contract to buy your car or something, and that person dies or becomes insane, the heirs can do it. And so just the death or incompetency does not terminate the offer. Uh, uh, the offeror cannot revoke it because you've got a contract not to revoke it. Destruction of the subject matter does terminate it. Number six does terminate it. Uh, the next issues have to do with the acceptance when the acceptance is effective and when rejections are effective. Now, we know the Adams versus Lenzel rule. And the Adams versus Lenzel rule says, in effect, that uh, acceptances are effective when uh, they are dispatched. Now, the reason for that rule, it's, it's partly historical uh, that it just kind of happened that way. But people also explain the rule in the following way. You make me an offer, and you don't know if I'm going to accept it or not. Okay. And now, if I send you back an acceptance, and if the acceptance is not effective until you get it, okay, then uh, I won't know when you got it, if you got it. And so I won't know that a contract has been formed until you get my uh, acceptance and let me know you got it. Uh, the other way to do it is to say, well, the contract is formed when I send you the acceptance, when I dispatch it. Well, in that case, you don't know uh, whether or not the contract has been formed because you don't know that I dispatched it until you get it. And so somebody during this trans transition period is going to be without knowledge. turns out that it is the offeror. If you make the offer to me, when, as soon as I dispatch my, my acceptance, the contract is formed right then. Even if you never get it, it gets lost in the mail, the contract is still formed at that time. Now, so acceptances are effective when dispatched. But on the other hand, a rejection, if I send back to you and say, no, I don't want to do this, and I reject your offer, that's not effective until you get it. And so effect, uh, uh, rejections are effective upon receipt, but offers on dispatch, and so that can present a problem. Suppose, for example, I send an acceptance, and then I send a rejection. Well, the acceptance is effective upon dispatch, but if I send the rejection, and suppose the rejection gets there first, I send the acceptance by mail, I send the rejection by email. So the rejection gets there first. <coughs> then the rule is that the acceptance is effective upon dispatch unless the rejection gets there first and the offeree relies on it. You got to have both of these. If the rejection gets there first and the offeree relies on it, then the contract becomes unenforceable against the offeree. I mean, against the offeror. Suppose the rejection is sent and then the acceptance is sent. Well, if the, when the rejection is sent, uh, nothing happens because the rejection has no effect until it gets there. So sending the rejection has no legal effect. But then suppose you send the, re the acceptance 10 minutes later. Uh, and well, the rejection hasn't had any legal effect yet, and now you make an acceptance, looks like you got a contract. And, uh, but the way that case is handled is as shown here. That if you send the rejection and then you send the acceptance, then it depends on which one arrives first. If the rejection arrives first, there's a rejection. If the acceptance arrives first, it's an acceptance. Now, if the acceptance arrives later, the, that acceptance, the later arriving acceptance, is not, not a counteroffer. Okay. Now, uh, the, that pretty much ex, uh, says everything that needs to be said about offer and acceptance. We're not in this uh, lecture dealing with the 2-207 cases where the acceptance can vary from the offer. You know the common law rule that the acceptance has to exactly match the offer. But if it uh, doesn't perfectly match the offer uh, at common law, that would be a rejection and counteroffer. But under the UCC, you can have acceptances that vary from the offer 
and there's a separate lecture on 2-207. But except for that, uh, that is, uh, pretty much concludes what needs to be said about formation of contracts. The key thing here is that you've got to let these people talk about the contract and talking about it and saying what price you'd sell it for if you wanted to and giving opinions and so forth. None of this constitutes a promise. And what you need is a promise. And if this person promises, I will sell it if you'll buy it, or I'll buy it if you'll sell it, then that's when you have the intent to make a bargain. When you have doubts, use the reasonable person standard. For example, suppose this person, the buyer, thought or, or they were buying from a particular person. Or better yet, take the case where there's a, a person owns a lot and wants to sell the lot. And they want to sell this lot to a particular person because it's right next door to them. And the person they're trying to sell it to is their high school friend that they've known for years. Now, it turns out that they do the whole transaction by mail, and somebody else with the same name buys this property. And the seller didn't realize it was somebody else. Well, normally, if I make an offer to X, only X can accept the offer. But if I make an offer to X and neither one of us know, knows that X is the wrong person, okay, then you resort to reach this, this objective standard. If X knew or should have known that X wasn't the right person, they cannot accept. But if X, the person I made the offer to, has no reason to know that they are the wrong person, and I don't know that they are the wrong person, then uh, the offer is good and they can accept it using this reasonable person standard. Now, you still may be able to get out of that kind of a contract on the basis of mistake, because uh, this is a, a, a mistake that goes to the essence of this agreement, because I'm trying to sell to my long-term friend, trying to have them buy the house, the space next door to me. So this is a mistake that goes to the core of the uh, contract, and there's a good chance that you might be able to get it rescinded for mistake if you pay the, the damages which the other person suffered. Uh, so uh, the offer and acceptance, look for the promise. If you find the promise, look to see that all the elements of the bargain are here. If the, all the elements of bargain are here, then you have an offer. And now did the person accept the offer? They can accept it by uh, orally, by doing what the offer said to do. They can accept it impliedly by doing things that lead a reasonable person to believe that the offer has been um, uh, accepted. And so that's the offer and acceptance. And after that, it's really pretty much a matter of the special circumstances. Termination is nothing particularly unique here about uh, the termination of the power of acceptance. The uh, timing issues that we brought up here are important. Uh, and this, this kind of material does get tested, so be sure that you understand this. That is the end of this lecture on offer and acceptance.